Hey, it's Fletcher, Vice President of Public Safety Solutions here at 911 Inform. Welcome to this episode of Next Generation 911 Future Makers. This podcast is not only about the next generation of 911 services, but fostering the next generation of 911 leadership. So sit back, listen, and enjoy this session of a Next Generation 911 Future Maker. Next Generation 911, obviously something that is moving forward. And the Next Gen 911 Future Makers podcast is about the next generation of leadership. So an individual that's joining me today is someone who's been a student of this industry for over two decades. He started out at the at the turn of uh, turn of the current century as a fire dispatcher in New York City, worked his way up, and uh, he was spent a lot of time with with Nina as a 911 PSAP director and is now out selling his wares and PSAP call taking CAD applications. None other than Mr. Christopher Carver. Welcome to Next Gen 911 Future Makers, my friend. Good uh, good morning, Martin. Thank you for having me. Very nice to be here and very nice to see you for the first time in a long time. It's been a long time since we've actually talked to each other and even longer since we've seen each other. Yes, indeed. A crazy year, a very and, crazy year. And 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 there's a joke in there, but I'm going to behave. And I'm just going to let it lie. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably for the best. So you you've had a long career uh, in public safety, and and you've lived through some of the difficult times where the industry learned a lot of lessons. And I'm talking specifically about 9/11 and mm-hmm. Superstorm Sandy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so. You know, it's interesting. The, the, the reality is that 9-11 sort of lives in its own place, right? It's its own sort of box. It's its own planet, if you will, in terms of its impact on public safety. But whether it's Superstorm Sandy or the blackout of 2003 or uh, the blizzard of 2010 or a variety of other events, um, fortunately or unfortunately, uh, my career has intersected with a great many um, really unbelievable and almost unimaginable at the time events. Uh, but, but fortunately from each one of those, there's been a whole lot of learning and a whole lot of, uh, of illustration of really what helps organizations and, and really the entire 911 industry succeed in times of crisis and chaos. Other than, geez, we should have done this 20 years ago. What of all these events, what's the number one thing that that's you learned over these? Uh, that, Absolutely, positively, 100%. It's about the people that are in the seats being trained, supported, and empowered to do the things they need to do to succeed. Um, So often, leaders in the 911 space see themselves as the person that's going to get it done. Maybe they don't do it intentionally, but they take on sort of this, this role of, for lack of a better term, being the hero that's going to solve all the problems, right? Well, the reality is you're just one person. And the people that are going to make the decisions that are going to make the organization succeed are going to be the people that are there when it actually happens. And that may be three o'clock in the morning when you're sound asleep in bed and your night shift supervisor decides to enact a a really quick thought out policy about handling a, a rapid influx of fire alarms and instead of doing what they would normally do, drops down assignments, say, for example, and now maybe it's happening due to a storm. Now you get a report of a fire. And instead of the first due unit coming from 50 miles away, they're coming from three miles away. And that's a demonstrable difference. And, and really, that, that's what life and death decisions are, is taking the, taking the chance, and it is a risk, to proactively make those decisions. But those decisions have to oftentimes be made by a first line supervisor, maybe even a single dispatcher working inside a one seat uh, operation on a night shift. Uh, and if you, if you train and empower and value your people and get them to, be, to know that they're trusted, that you believe they're going to make the right decisions when they have to, then your organization can adapt and, and really overcome, I won't say anything, but, but pretty close to anything. You know, I think back when I was flying the desk back in 1980 and even back when you were flying the desk in New York city in early two thousands, the technology that we had at our fingertips was pretty much limited and, and very Mm -hmm. 
static raw data compared to what's available today. Um, you know, I, I sit back and I wonder how we made decisions that we made back then, knowing that people still don't even have all the information they need today. Right. No. Yep. Yep. No. And, and to be honest, so my, my, my dispatching career started before I got to New York. It started in central Ohio as a fire EMS dispatcher in a single seat secondary. I, I wouldn't call it a peace app. It maybe only had one or two of those letters. It certainly did not have all four <laughs> primary or secondary. Great place to work. The front part of a firehouse as many people have started out their communications careers, you know, the firefighters in the back and, you know, your first day of training, you ask the obvious question, well, there's just me here. So what happens if things get really busy? And then the person training says, well, then the firefighters will come up to help you. They're, they're just in the back. And I said, well, if it gets really busy, they're not here. And that sort of, you know, that was kind of where that ended. That conversation never picked up again. Instead, you learned how to not just leverage an old cassette recorder, you know, version of dictaphone and a, and a, and a, red, a literal red phone that wasn't even rotary dial. It just had no dial because it was a ring down directly from the police department for 911 conferences. We had no any alley. We had a CAD that was literally designed by some guy's son in his basement using Microsoft Access 1947 or whatever year <laughs> that, that thing came out. And that's how you worked. And if more than one call came in at a time, you just had to figure it out because there was nobody else there and there was nothing, there was nowhere else it was going to go. So, you know, most of the time that was okay. But to your point, you had to figure out how to leverage what you did have. And you had to figure out how to leverage, you know, yourself and your own knowledge and your own ability. And you had to leverage kind of your ability to be creative and be insightful and figure out how to do some things that, you know, were required by the time. Say, for example, a thunderstorm comes through and you've got seven, eight, nine, 10, 20 runs at the same time. Um, it was a challenge, but it was, it was one that, that was also very educational. So the technology thing you mentioned, I have seen it in both the smallest agencies that are in a challenging position, and I've seen it in the largest agencies that are in a challenging position. Um, FDNY, you know, was still on when I left and still is on to this day. The, same, the very first CAD they ever introduced, uh, which, of course, originated in a mainframe type world, uh, black screen, green letters. I remember when we got colors. That was a big day. And, uh, you know, in, in, in seeing CAD visually was an awesome thing. But the reality was that system is there because it also still worked in a very real way. It was fast and it did most of what they needed it to do. So part of that's adaptation to that environment. Part of it is creating great tools from minute one that can serve an agency's need for a long time. I think that's one of the big challenges in the industry is you know, a lot, too many times I've talked to developers that have developed an application that have never seen a 911 center. One of my favorite lines uh, back at, I don't even I remember if it was Nortel or Avaya, but I was on a conference call and we were talking about new capabilities we wanted to develop and we needed a developer that had a 911 expertise. Mm -hmm. And a guy jumps on the call and, uh, do you, do you understand 911? Oh, yeah, yeah. I've dialed it many times. I swear to God, Chris, that's what <laughs> he said. I've dialed you know, it many times. Uh, yeah, I, I, I unfortunately, through my time at Nina uh, in, in that time, I was exposed to, to a few, okay, more than a few uh, folks that had great intentions. And I applaud anyone who wants to help make public safety better. But creating, for example, a standalone system inside a PSAP that sits on its own terminal in the back of the room and, and having the conversation and trying to get folks to understand it has to be integrated in the workflow of the center or else the busier it gets, the more risk is in the, associated with something that's not integrated, right? When folks get busy, they're not going to pay attention to that one thing sitting off in the corner, and that's going to be a problem. So by all means, and, and this speaks to NG911 too, by all means, bring upon the technology that, that will make things better, that will help save lives, but don't break the thing while you're trying to fix the thing or improve it. 
And NG911 specifically offers such an opportunity for advancement and growth. But it also offers, if it's not done right, the opportunity to introduce a whole lot of challenging additions to the public safety technology ecosystem that might not have the intended effect. You're absolutely right. And I remember a few years ago, you and I both spoke at, uh, it was probably a Nina Goes to Washington event because we were, we were in D.C. And uh, you and I did a session on swatting. Yes, we both spoke and um, and dug out the, the old chips <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> references. And I think you you actually you actually brought out the, the case uh, in your session. One of the very early chips episodes was a swatting incident. Absolutely. It was. Yeah, right. absolutely. Using the utilizing the call boxes. It was in the first or second season of chips. This kid, it, it, it's it's actually for those of you that are in the, that, that are watching this that have any inclination of chips at all, you will probably remember it. For those of you that are of a generation that has no idea what in the world chips is, other than something that comes in a bag and it's kind of greasy, and probably if you're concerned about your health, you shouldn't eat. Uh, you shouldn't eat them. Uh, it phenomenal show and phenomenal episode because and interesting, very relevant for today because the way this kid was delivering the false alarms was by reporting uh, erroneous locations from highway call boxes to the California Highway Patrol and generating this massive response. And, and the CAD that was, you know, the CAD that was on the desk, you know, was pre AS 400 and, and era uh, and just really interesting, but it's also a challenge to us today. I think that episode was probably from 1977, right? So we're 44 years. If I can do math, Mark, you're going to have to help me here. We're 44 years on and still have the same problems. We've introduced, we've, yeah, we still have location issues. We still have the ability of people to do swatting or other things and generate responses that we're not supposed to generate. And it's really amazing how some things may change. Uh, There's no Dodge Polaris running around in the California Highway Patrol right now, I don't think, unless they have a museum collection that's doing it. Um, But, but the reality is that more things change, the more they stay the same in some ways. But that show, so you and I are about the same age. I mean, that shape. Let's not be insulting, Mark. Yeah. <laughs> but go ahead. Yes. I might have more years than you. I've got more, a lot of things than you. Most do. people do. Most do. Most do. <laughs> but that's a show that kind of shaped our lives, right? As we were growing up. Absolutely. I, mean, I was a teenager when that show was, was playing on TV. Yeah, absolutely. That and if you look at um, that, well, the two uh, the two foundationals, of course, are chips and emergency, which created in every one of. And I'll say, even though we may not be the same age, I would say we're in the same generation. Mark, I'll, yes, I'll say yes. we're in the same the same generation. You know, we I still, if I go to a community that utilizes some sort of rapid response vehicle for EMS runs, that is that is a Johnny and Roy rescue truck because sure. of the show Emergency, right? But but from those, and that's actually, that's a challenge for our, the current generation of public safety. Although we have some amazing things that are going on right now, you know, the IM911 movement, and the move to NG911, and, and greater concern about recognizing public safety communications professionals as public safety professionals, first and foremost, those are all great things. I kind of wonder, I have to wonder, what will be this generation's touch point? What will they look back at 20 or 30 years from now or 40 years from now as the thing that did exactly what you just described? What will shape their, uh, you know, their experience? And maybe there's an opportunity there, whether it's for some sort of television show or maybe it's for a continued movement for the professionalization of the field, whatever it is. I, I think we're kind of still looking for that and trying to find it. And, and I, I, I mean, it'd be cool if people 100 years are still looking back at chips and emergency and going, oh, my God, that's the, that's the end all be all. But uh, it's time for some new things, too. Yeah, I mean, you can you there, there are always telltales that you can say to people um, that kind of indicate not so much age, but where they are or where they were in their career at inflection points. Yep. And, you know, if you say KMG 365 to somebody right away by the look on their face, yep. you will yep. know where to place them. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And, you know, the, the, one of the things you, were, you asked me before about, you know, the, the key lessons learned from my experiences. 
one of the other things related to the same value about people is that putting value on people is not just something for the managers and directors and supervisors to do. Putting value on fellow people inside this profession is also something that our senior folks must do. We have to stop eating our young in this profession. And if you do that KMG365 to them and they come back with a blank stare that looks like you've just spoken some combination of Arabic, Swahili, and a language <laughs> from some other planet, talk to them about it and explain it. You know, we, we have to not dismiss the younger people in our profession because someday somebody else is going to have to put this headset on unless we want a whole bunch of 100-year-old dispatchers who are really burnt out and probably not very fast at typing. You know, the, the, the reality is that if the people are the key to our success as a profession, as a whole, then all of us have that responsibility to look out for it. Maybe that, that's a great example of how to do it. Introduce those cultural touchstones that maybe the new folks don't, don't really know and support their kind of growth and evolution. Well, that was kind of the premise of this whole podcast series, Next Generation 911 Future Makers. So it's not about Next Generation 911 per se, about the technology side, although that is a touch point. It's about what leadership can do today. It's about the mission that you, I, everyone that we know, it's the duty that we have to build that next generation of leadership. And if that's teaching them KMG365, Great, that's fine. And it's teaching them all the other life lessons that we've learned. All of the times that we learned not to touch the stove because the stove right. is hot. Right, right. And, you know, and looking back at my time at Nina, one of the programs that Nina offered that, you know, and there's just so much going on. And, and I guess I would characterize it as, a, as, a, as an opportunity that has been somewhat missed across our industry, where where Nina and APCO and some of the other professional organizations, and maybe this is best lived at the state chapter levels, I think there's really a strong need and value for us to create formalized mentorship programs to, to give, you know what, it's great that we have like, for example, the young people's events or young people's mixers and things like that at uh, conferences. Right. But I also look at that and kind of with a little bit of, a little bit of disdain or a little bit of, of fear because it starts to segment people out and we need to leverage every chance we can to do what you just described, to share in cross and cross generalize in cross generational ways, excuse me, the lessons learned, because I don't want you to have to go. If you're watching this podcast and you are five years in your profession, I do not want you to have to go through another 9-11 to learn the lessons that came out of that. I don't want you to have to go through another blackout, another, that our, our goal should not be that the, the, the required event must happen for you to gain the lessons. And for those of us that are at this point, you know, 25 years and beyond, and, and I'm so happy to hear that you're going to be talking to Steve Souter soon. I hope it didn't break the news and, and kind of give away a, 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 an announcement um, inadvertently. But sharing the lessons from people like that is so unbelievably critical. So that not because not only is it information and is it awareness, the most important thing that, that generational leaders do is show the next generation what's possible. You know, I, I taught when I present on leadership, I talk a lot about Roger Bannister, you know, being the first person to break the four minute mile. It's great that he did that. But the most important thing about Roger Bannister breaking the four minute mile wasn't that he was the first person to do it. It's that he wasn't the last. And so something that was supposedly impossible for humans to do, someone did it and everybody else went, oh my God, you mean we can do it? And think of the number of things in the 911 world that we just assume cannot be done. I know, of, I know of agencies that say, oh, no, we can never get funding for that new CAD record system, even though our current CAD is held up by duct tape, chewing gum, and a couple nails driven into the side of a, of a 20-year-old server. And we just pray to God the thing works. Think of how many 911 agencies never asked to go to a training course. 
never asked to go to a conference, never asked to improve policies or institute some sort of employee appreciation day during National Public Safety Telecommunicator Week. Why? Because they don't think it's possible and they assume the answer is no. So hearing from the people that have done it shows them, oh, there is a path and maybe gets them to see themselves as able to improve their surroundings and their organizations and do some really great things. You know, this is exactly why I pick people like yourself to be a part of this series. That was incredibly inspirational, insightful. Who wrote that for you? Cause that's <laughs> <laughs> no, I, so it's funny. I, it's funny because, you know, I, I, I have to, I have to wonder, I laugh sometimes about people that are around me frequently because I do sound like a broken record. You know, I, I pretty much, if you've ever taken a class that, that I've presented, which by the way, thank you, if you have, or if you've attended a session, I've done at a conference, I, I thank you. And I, I find myself, even though I'll talk about different topics and stuff as Mark, you do, or I do, or all of us do that, that sort of do the presentation thing. What it really comes down to is three or four really basic concepts. And, 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 that, and that's one of them you know, really. So, so I, I would say it's not just written. Um, it's, it's ingrained, you know, and, but even, even though you may think that you're a broken record, it's because you hear the same thing over and over and over and over again, but keep in mind, keep in mind when, when you start feeling like that, think about the people that come up to you and say, Oh my God, that right. was insightful. I never right. realized right. that as right. long as those people exist, you are not repeating yourself. Right. Right. Well, and you know, the unfortunate thing too, going back to experiences that I hope no one ever has, I'll share just. So unfortunately um, some of the most defining experiences that happen in your career, that create that, excuse me, that uh, the thought, that, that, that sort of mindset that I just mentioned are, are ones where your own fellow coworkers or your own fellow people that you see every day, maybe inside your organization, but a different role, where, where they illustrate to you just how far we have to come. And those stories become part of your DNA. And I'll share one very briefly. Uh, after, a, after an incredibly, um, traumatic event in New York City uh, that impacted not just the, the residents of the city of New York, but a number of dispatchers that were actually working. Um, the request to get a counseling unit in for dispatchers, the request to reach out for funding support for, you know, sort of a, a charitable way for dispatchers who'd been negatively impacted in, in their homes, right, um, was rebuffed by at least three or four people above me in rank or in position who I was shocked that did that. Uh, some to the effect of, oh, we don't need anybody else's help. Or what do you mean that the dispatchers need uh, a, the counseling? You know, you're not a, I was told you're not an effing therapist or not an effing psychiatrist. I forget what the words were. And that came from somebody who had ultimate responsibility for 200 people who had just been through a multi-day traumatic event. And, you know, after hearing that and kind of sitting down for a couple of minutes and thinking about it, you know, I, the decision was made for me then, and that was almost 10 years ago, that I would not, if I ever had the power to be a voice for doing things a better way, that I would take it and that, that, uh, that I would not sit by and let the wrong thing happen to people who I worked with and cared about just because of the ignorance and unawareness on the part of people who are in positions of authority. I guess it's, it's fair to say that not only do we need to train our core level individuals, but we need to train our senior level individuals as well. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, you know, the reality is that uh, other than ships reruns and emergency reruns, there's some other things that are still around from the mid seventies as well. And, and those are some bad ones, some, some mindset things. You know, I've heard it said, well, we don't need to do recognition for our dispatchers because it's their job and they're just doing their job. I've, you know, I've heard various versions of, well, that was the way I was treated when I started. Therefore, that makes it okay today. You know, and I'm sure you've heard those things too. And, and really, that's, that is from the top down. And it's getting better. 
but I hope that we don't just replace one bad mindset with another. The one I mentioned earlier, where sort of people see themselves as, as the, as a hero complex and they think they're going to solve every problem and kind of do so without the engagement of the people that are underneath them, you know, and in both cases, whether it's that sort of short-sighted mindset from the seventies or potentially a short-sighted mindset from the two thousands, the answer is the problem, the inherent problem is the same. If you take your eyes off the point, why are we there? And you take your eyes off the people that are going to get that done, which is the people in the seats and the people that are working day to day. If you lose sight of those two points, then your organization is not going to be as effective as it could be. And it may even fail. And it's funny because that's not just true in operations, right? That's true in technology too. If you just buy something and don't engage the folks that are going to use it and get their buy-in and get their support and get the understanding of their needs, then the technology thing will fail just like writing a new policy that can't be, cannot be implemented because you never bothered to vet it with the people that actually are responsible for making it happen. It's the same problem, unfortunately, happens gen- every, in every generation. And that's really where I think we as an industry need to make sure that, that whether it's training or awareness or peer-to-peer support or mentoring, whatever it is, and it's probably a combination of those things and many more, uh, that, that we do everything we can to avoid those, those types of problems. Do you think the technology is changing at a rate where it's reshaping the type of individual that wants to be a, a public safety telecommunications official? So not only that, I can provide a very a great real world example. It was a firehouse world in San Diego presenting this a few years ago. And for those of you that are fire service related, they're watching this or aware, there's a thing called IFSTA which does training manuals for the fire service. And I'm out wandering around the expo hall floor, as I always do. I love to see new stuff and kind of window shop, if you will, just in case I want to buy a fire engine or an ambulance next week. And there's a little bookstore for IFSTA. And I'm also very, I have a bit of pride about being in the public safety telecommunications world, right? I'm very, very, very proud of being a dispatcher at my core and being in the fire service at my core. I go up to the bookshop, and I'm looking, they have all the latest IFSTA titles, but they're missing one, their communications and dispatching book. It's not there. So, of course, now I'm a little bit offended. I'm like, well, I can read all about air, you know, aircraft firefighting foam and how to build a brush truck and, and how to do this thing and that thing. But there's no books about dispatching and communications, which no matter how great a firefighter you are or a police officer or an EMT, if you can't get to the call or you can't know that it happened, it's going to be really hard to practice your skills effectively, right? So to me, it's foundational. So I go up and ask the guy who's there, where's the, commu- where's the latest communications book? I kind of would like to see it and what's going on. And he gets this really, like his face ashen. Well, sir, hold on just a minute. Okay, I didn't know that would create a big stir. He goes behind the booth, grabs the manager, vice president guy who's there, brings him out. This, sir, this gentleman would like to see the latest communications book. Couldn't, you know, I said, okay, fine. He comes up and he says, well, sir, we're no longer printing that book. We're no longer doing that. So now I'm about this close to the New York side of me coming out. I said, what do you mean you're no longer printing the communications guy? I mean, that's a whole, it's like a foundation. It's a building block of public safety. What are you talking about? Well, sir, things are changing so fast inside communications and 911 that we cannot keep up. And any book that we've tried to print on what's going on inside communications and 911 is out of date the day we print it. So we're just doing things online for that. And that that was years ago. And that still sticks with me because I, in my opinion, to your point, Mark, the pace of change is actually accelerating from then, right? And so not only... Is it adjusting the, the type of people, I think? It's making the job even harder in a way. Because now you are going to have all these different types of information coming in. We always used to joke, right? We always had to be able to multitask. Well, multitask before meant phone and radio. And maybe somebody in the room yelling at you. All right, so I had three inputs of communication 
and, and information that I had to manage. But imagine an NG911 world in five years, where, in my personal opinion, the last way we know about a car accident in five years will be by a phone call. It's going to be traffic sensors, telematics, AI attached to um, roadway sensors. It's going to be all this different stuff. And you're going to sit there and you're going to get a blip that's going to say, alert, likely automobile accident, serious in nature on I-95 um, near the Outer Bridge Crossing. I'll use a New Jersey reference for you, Mark, to try to you know, make this easy. Appreciate that. Yeah. At yeah, least I could do. And then you're going to get the phone calls, right? But then you're going to get all the other sensors and things like that. And it's not just that the telecommunicators need to, need to probably evolve their skills to effectively manage that. It's also that the companies that are providing the technology need to evolve their products. Or else, not only are we going to change telecommunicators, we could potentially see them buried in a full NG911 world with everything that's going to come out. You know, I just, just so you know, you're like the third or fourth person in the last, I don't know, 100 days that has said to me that in the next five years, sensor-initiated 911 calls are going to outnumber user-initiated 911 calls. Yep. Nobody wants to put that number out there because it's a little bit in the ether and it could go either way. Mm -hmm. But you are like the fourth person that said, you know, probably based on my opinion, mm -hmm. in the next five years that we're going to reach and surpass that tipping point. I just find that interesting. And, and the people that are saying that, granted, you know, total slouches in the industry, Jameson PV House, uh, Ty Wooten, yourself, you know. <laughs> I'm, people I'm people that you can't really listen to. Slouches. <laughs> oh, by yeah, the man. way, by the way, you'll be very proud to know that I have trained a very, very good friend of ours, Ty Wooten, in New York City CPR. Oh, well done. Hey, breathe or you'll freaking die. <laughs> now, if he's holding a slice of pizza folded in his hand at the yeah. same time, yeah. that's extra credit. Well, that's that's, that's, that's the advanced. That's the right. advanced. <laughs> right. So we're still on basic. All right. That's we're still good. on basic. All right. That's good. good. That's very good. See, as, um, a, as a true New Yorker, you totally understand that and no, can expand on that sort of Without a doubt. You know, I, I definitely was there long enough to get my card and... Uh, and, and I, you know, I, I will still slip into the accent a little bit when required, you know, but I do live back in Columbus now and have been back for five years. So I have to, I have to keep my Midwestern self or else they look at me really weird in the grocery store. So, yeah, well, I, you know what, we're hopefully if, if everything, if the stars and planets align, uh, maybe I'll be seeing you this summer. Uh, definitely at a, at a conference or two. I know. Thankfully, I'll be presenting at both Nina and APCO. So anybody that's watching this and wants to come by and say hello, it's, it's always great to meet new people. Um, I mean, this is what happens when I end up with friends for a long time, I end up with people like Mark. So it's good to have, it's good to have recycling, right? It's good to have some, some new faces come in and say hello as well. Yeah. Um, so you're at a technology company now. You're, you're at Hexagon now. What, what do you see new and innovative that's coming out, either something you're doing or the industry is doing? Sure. Where do you see the big influx? Well, I think the companies that are, um, and, and, and I'll talk about us, but this is an industry thing as well. I think the companies that are most focused on doing it right, doing it the right way and helping really shape how we're going to manage that future where you get 55 sensor activations for a truck, you know, for an automobile accident. So those companies, including Hexagon are in the middle of deploying our artificial intelligence, smart cities type solutions that support a world like that. Because as you know, innovation, although in some ways it happens overnight, the evolution of innovation is even more important. As we start to deploy it, learn how to deploy it, learn sort of what additional features need to be uh, brought into it and learn how to really connect it to the needs of agencies. So, for example, with us, um, you know, we're, we're in the process of launching a, a product known as Hexagon Connect, 
which basically supports the integration of almost an unlimited number of data points into a communication center, emergency operations center, real-time crime center, so that you can have an overall operational view of everything that's going on inside your community. And, and that really is inherent and a reflection of the realization, I think, that everybody's starting to get at, is that 911 is, is a lot more than 911. You know, in a, in a world where the sensors are going to be reporting things, well, then, who knows first about the major power outage or the power line down? Well, that's a utility company. Who knows first about flooding that's impacting a neighborhood where people may need to be rescued, especially in a coastal area that has a flood control or flood management system? It's those pumps that are coming on from the flood control system. When those things come on now, I know I've got a problem. I may have a neighborhood that's now underwater, and that's something I need to address as a 911 center. Um, weather, right? It, it, Chris Pet Peeve and 911 operations number one is normally severe storms are not a surprise. You know they're coming ahead of time. You know the National Weather Service is going to tell you the morning of, hey, there's a strong likelihood of severe weather in your area. That's something you should always be aware of. Well, integrating that flow of data so I know now that the tornadic thunderstorm is 15 minutes away from my community so I can start being proactive. You know, how often have we said, or I know we've said, 911 is too reactive, not proactive enough. So the vendors uh, like Hexagon and others are coming together with agencies that are also developing the mindset to say, hey, how can I be proactive in managing events and not reactive and just always being behind the eight ball? Because as you know, especially when you have those really crazy busy spurts, the storm, the blizzard, the special event, and really, we've been in one of those for the last year in some ways with a pandemic, right? If you get behind, it's almost impossible to catch up. And if you can take the steps ahead of time to modify responses or, or triage your events in a way that you're allocating resources to the best events that need them, you know, your highest priority EMS calls or your highest priority law enforcement calls, again, you have a better chance to succeed. So... Vendors, I think, today are becoming much more aware of the importance of that and collaboratively developing with our public safety partners tools to allow them to be proactive and have greater vision into the entirety of the things that impact public safety in the community, not just the 911 call, which is still obviously important, but is increasingly just one piece of that overall, uh, that overall awareness of what's going on inside your community. You know, in, in one respect, the, the pandemic really is a forced inflection point on, on our industry. Um, you, your 911 center is closed because of COVID. Everybody's got to go home, but I still need you to answer 911 calls. So figure out how to answer 911 calls remotely, where two months prior to that, Oh, we can't do that. We've got sieges issues. We've got NCIC issues. We've got, yep. you know, this can't be done. Blah, blah. No, you know what? It has to be done. So right. figure it out. Right. And, right. and you know what? Yeah, some hard decisions, a little bit of flex in the rules because it's got to be done. The, the, uh, the alternative is people die. And that's not a solution. So right. you got to bend the rules a little bit. And right. then you realize, hey, you know what? really wasn't that bad bending the rules. Well, I mean, we worked it again, out. Right. And again, if you, and I, I, I understand how this happens, but if you are a 911 director sitting in your office right now, and you don't have really an A, B and a C plan for what to do, if your center now cannot function, then Get together, I beg you, get together some smart people that you can find. If you can't find any smart people, then call me or Mark, we'll help. Whoever, whoever you can find will help. Figure out what it is that you can do. And it's probably, and this is the great thing about NG911, right? As states deploy their ESI nets, as states deploy network solutions for essential emergency infrastructure, uh, technology, and data, it now opens the door to do some really creative things. All right. So our first plan is, right, because there's multiple situations that your center may not be able to function at its full potential. One is an overload event there. There's just more calls coming in that we can handle. 
where do they go, right? So what's our plan for that? Two, what's our plan if this building just falls down? It gets hit by a tornado. There's a COVID uh, event there. There's, you know, who knows what could happen? There's so many different things that are still, however, shorter term in duration. Versus three, the building is completely obliterated by a tornado that likely is going to impact your neighboring centers as well. So if, you know, if, if, you know, go on, I just forgot the names of the towns from uh, It's a Wonderful Life that I always use for this. But if Potterville and all these other towns get wiped out, where are your calls going to go? Because that's the kind of world that we live in. And 911 at its best plans for the unexpected. Now, can you plan for every single eventuality? No, probably not. But I think we have a responsibility and obligation to give our community the best possible service we can and to never just say, well, it was too busy to answer the phone. Or it was, oh, no, we never figured out how to, you know, I've seen communities that their, their backup plan was to route their 911 calls to somewhere else. Yeah. But, they, but they had no plan on getting the runs back to be dispatched. Yeah. So, yes, they got answered, but that's only part of the equation. And the reality is there are tools and people and technologies out there to help us solve that problem. And we're getting more of them every day. So... Uh, yes, it, it's, an, it's an amazingly interesting time. And this concept of resilience that, Mark, Mark you're 100% right. If after the last year, you, you missed the lesson on we really need to be serious about ensuring continuity of operations no matter what, then, then I, I don't know what else to do. But here's the other thing that's important. And I think this is where the inflection point thing really matters. I think there's a lot of really smart people inside the centers but they've just been ever, never able to get that stakeholder involved. The city, uh, city council, the mayor, the city manager, the public safety director, the county commissioners. Well, now is an opportunity because of what you just said. This inflection point makes it crystal clear. This is what we need to do and why. And you have evidence on the real world implications of not ensuring that you have these, these plans and these technologies in place to support that. So not only do but not only do you have the inflection point, not only do you have case history from the last 365 days of living through a pandemic and 911 centers closing and people dispatching calls from their living rooms and all this other stuff, there's another key important point too. We have federal funding coming to support it. So if you have a need and you have some degree of federal funding from CARES Act, which is one pot, but we may also see the infrastructure bill come with significant NG911 funding this is why it matters. The time is now to leverage the inflection point because that's what inflection point is for, right? If it just makes us think differently, it's really not done its job. But if it gives us a point of motivation for action on our point, on our part, as well as our leaders in our communities to say, hey, let's get off our butt and let's go fix this so that in three years, five years, if there's, God forbid, another pandemic or a tornado or something, we can still operate and not just operate, but operate in a way that to the public, they really don't see much difference. Then I think we've, then I think we've learned the lesson of the pandemic. And I think we've actually made the last year um, a tool for positive change, which, you know, with all the tragedy and heartbreak that's come out of the last year, it would be nice to be able to say that, that we did, we did find some, some silver lining inside this really dark cloud. We've got a unique opportunity to look into ourselves and our resources and new people coming on board, learning how to keep them, learning how to plant them, grow them, fertilize them, and ultimately yep. harvest them for the future. And, uh, you know, this is about building the leadership, the next generation of leadership. You know, someday we're going to retire. And I'd like to know that there are going to be people there that will continue on with new ideas that I never thought about right. because I never experienced it. You know, you right. can learn so much from people like Steve Souter. And I think everybody should get 15 minutes with Steve, right? right, right. As you come in, that should be a badge of honor that you right. get. Right. Um, but then we should get 15 minutes with the new guy as well. Right because they're going to come up with stuff that's totally different 
from our perspective, new right. set of eyes. Yeah, absolutely. And my challenge to anybody watching this podcast, I, I'm going to go on a limb here and say that anybody watching this really cares about 911. I'm going to say that the people that watch this are passionate about this profession. If everyone that watches this could just find one person that they could help out a little bit. You know, the rule, when I was a supervisor in New York on the platform, the, the, what I always told my shift was the difference between the best dispatcher and the worst dispatcher was one hour out of their 12 hour tour, one hour. And here's how I told them to spend that one hour, spend 30 minutes learning, pick up anything in this room you want to and learn about, whether it's how the building works, whether it's how our alarm box system works, whether it's how the new purple people eater catapult truck works that the fire department bought. I don't care. Spend 30 minutes learning. Then out of that other half hour, spend 10 minutes making some, making this place better. Cook the meal, take out the trash, clean up, do something to make this place a little bit better and contribute to our overall, just the physical place around us. And then spend 10 minutes with somebody that came on after you. Because even if you came on last Tuesday and they came on last Wednesday, you know something that they don't know. Vice versa, the other 10 minutes is they, they sharing with you. Ideally, someone senior to you, but maybe not. In other words, we always have something to share with someone, and we always have something to learn from someone. And we always have the ability to make our organizations a little bit better. And, I th and we always have this, the opportunity to make ourselves a little bit better. And if we just remember that, even if it's not a formalized mentorship process, even if it's just, you know, Mark, what you did for me, I learned from you just, and, you know, the reality is sitting in a bar, sitting there having a beer. Well, I can't really have beer. I'm on a blood sugar thing. I have to have a vodka club soda. But just sitting down talking about, you know, sometimes people make fun of the, the more senior 911 people for sharing war stories or sharing that. That's really how you learn. That's really how you grow. And that's really how you make those connections. You can label it mentorship if you want, or if you prefer, if it suits your your if it suits your mind a little bit better, that's really the benefit of making friendships inside this profession because you're going to learn from that and you're going to learn just, the, you're going to learn some of the most important lessons you ever will just sitting down talking to people and having conversations about things they've done and things they've been through and ideas they've had and ideas you've had. So my, my challenge to anybody watching this is to find those, find at least one person and ideally a group you know, that you can go outside with and sit down or sit down at the bar or sit down at breakfast or wherever it is and, and have those conversations. And, and that's exactly how, Mark, we're going to accomplish what you just talked about. That's how we're going to grow that next generation because Lord knows we have to because it, it's not going to get any easier and the challenges aren't going to go away. And there's always going to be one more hard day. And, and that's how you get through it. Chris Carver our next gen 911 future maker for this week. I really appreciate you sitting down and joining us. Uh, you're the uh, director of sales for the East uh, for Hexagon. So let me ask you, do they not have an HR department or do they just don't do background checks on employees? <laughs> well, I, I think they, I did meet the HR folks, but they were very busy when I got hired. So sometimes okay. I wonder I wonder if they had time to really do their due diligence. And, Things slip through the cracks. It and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I may have used an assumed name. I, I don't know. I don't know. But either way, I'm here. I've been here for two years. And, and I'm, I'm very proud to, uh, to really work uh, for, for public safety in the entire eastern half of the U.S. and really beyond. You know, fortunately, they, they allow me and give me the opportunity to also be sort of our, our industry expert on the team and, and go out and engage and do presentations and have conversations like these and and it's great to be part of an organization that that's that passionate about not just public safety, but doing public safety in the right way. Hey, if you, if you snuck in under the wire, I'm certainly not going to give up the ghost. I Don't appreciate worry about that, Mark. It. Thank you. Chris, thanks so much for joining. Hopefully I get to see you in Columbus and we can share some more stories, but uh, thank you for being a next gen 911 future maker. And thank you for joining me on this podcast. Uh, again, you're the epitome of why, I'm doing this because of the knowledge that you have to share with our future for this industry. So, well, thank you. And I, I'm only passing on things that I was fortunate to learn from others. And, and that's all my goal is, uh, 
is, is I have been so fortunate and so blessed to work with and for a bunch of great people over the last 26 plus years and, and passing some of what they've given me or as much as what they've given me as possible on. Uh, if I have any opportunity to do that, such as chatting with you here today, Mark, then that's an opportunity that I'm, I'm fortunate to have. Great. Thanks very much for joining. Have a great day. Thank you. That wraps up this session of Next Generation 911 Future Makers. This is Fletch. Thanks so much for listening. Remember, you can follow me on Twitter at Fletch911. You can check out the rest of my blogs and podcasts at Fletch.tv. And if you like what you heard today, be sure to click on subscribe below. And don't forget to click that bell so you'll be notified whenever a new podcast is published. This podcast is made possible through the support of 911 Inform, making next generation 911 solutions for the enterprise and making seconds count. Graphics design and layout is by Samantha Wayant. I'm your host, Mark Fletcher, ENP. Once again, thanks so much for listening. I certainly do appreciate it. Stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.